Good afternoon. Welcome. Today's special event on how the public and private sectors in the Americas can translate supply chain relocation from rhetoric to reality. I'm Jason Marzak, Senior Director of the Atlantic Council's Adrian Arch Latin America Center. Senator Cassidy, Senator Bennett, welcome. Welcome as well to Mr. Alfaro, Mr. Rosales, Vice Minister Trejos, uh, Das Wells joining us in studio, Board Member Teresa Carlson, nearshoring partner Kareem Lasima, and other distinguished speakers. I'd also want to start off by giving a warm welcome to those watching us both in studio today as well as watching on the C-SPAN network as well as via ACTV on our multiple social media channels. Today we mark the official launch of a new focus on nearshoring here at the Atlantic Council. In the coming months, we will assemble a nonpartisan hemispheric group of practitioners to advance this work with an initial focus on Central America and Mexico. We thank two good friends of the Atlantic Council for their support. Millicom is a founding member of the Nearshoring Working Group, and Baker McKenzie is a longtime supporter of our past work on trade and supply chains. A bit of context. Why are we here talking about nearshoring? Why is it so important? Why must we avoid delay? For one, global supply chains have been severely tested by a myriad of shocks in the past years, between pandemic-driven delays, high transportation costs, and of course, geopolitical tensions. As companies grow increasingly wary of the risks of a resilience on far-flung supply chain sourcing, Latin America and the Caribbean has the potential to become a major destination for supply chain relocation, thus minimizing the risks to U.S. economic interests. As well, the region's strategic location and close ties to the U.S. present an opportunity for businesses to reduce expenditures of both time and money, in addition to streamlining production and expanding market potential. It's in the interest of the U.S. and the Americas Estimates from the Inter-American Development Bank show nearshoring could add an annual $78 billion in additional exports of goods and services in Latin America and the Caribbean. But while nearshoring presents a major opportunity, translating it from rhetoric into reality has proven more challenging than expected, and that must be addressed. So far, success stories like the likes of the new Tesla factory in Nuevo León, Mexico, appear to be more of an exception than the norm. So what's part of the solution? At the Adrian Arch Latin America Center, we believe at least three sets of conditions must be in place for nearshoring to materialize and sustain. First, we need to sync up both international push factors and domestic pull factors. On the international push side, factors such as the pandemic, Russia's invasion of Ukraine, growing environment, social and government requirements, and U.S. policy efforts can push supply chains toward Latin America and the Caribbean. But we also need domestic pull factors. Countries need enhanced domestic economic competitiveness, including macroeconomic stability, regulatory and legal certainty and simplicity, better physical as well as digital infrastructure, education, skills, and enhanced productivity and innovation. In short, we need the right mix of local and external conditions. Second, the public and private sectors must both be on board and part of the discussion. Well-designed local public sector actions in Latin America can facilitate and attract investments. Here, greater coordination between the U.S. government, including Congress, and the business community can ensure that U.S. policy action serves to provide the right catalyst for investment. And greater private sector buy-in can generate nearshoring investment, job opportunities, and confidence, which in turn boosts productivity and prosperity. Nearshoring needs to make business sense for the private sector. And then third, we need to combine short-term results with long-term vision. Nearshoring must have a minimal level of consensus and con continuity across political cycles, and of course be a nonpartisan issue. And that's evidenced, thankfully, today by the joint participation of Senators Cassidy and Bennett in this discussion. The Atlantic Council, we're bridge builders, and we are uniquely well positioned to catalyze each set of factors and synergize them. Through this three-prong approach, our forthcoming nearshoring working group aims to answer the following questions that we'll also look at this afternoon. Which sectors and factors are most ripe for productive uh, production relocation to the Americas? How can countries take advantage of these opportunities? What are some of the key factors that make companies rethink their dependence on traditional overseas locations like China and pull them toward the Americas? And then also, what policy changes do the regional governments and the U.S. implement to catalyze and synergize push and pull factors? So with all that, I'm absolutely honored to have Senator Bill Cassidy and Senator Michael Bennett join us virtually for our, their first conversation as co-sponsors of the Bipartisan Americas Act, which calls for, among other things, to create an overarching foreign and economic policy toward countries in the Western Hemisphere. 
Senators Cassidy and Bennett are here for a greater conversation on this bill and the importance of this bill. Notably, this bill includes provisions aimed at encouraging businesses to reshore or nearshore from China to the U.S. and other Western Hemisphere countries and urge governments to work with the U.S. to contain the advancement of China in the hemisphere. Senator Cassidy is a senior U.S. Senator for Louisiana. He's a member of the Republican Party, and he served as Senator since 2015, coming to the Capitol Hill originally as a member of the House after his 2008 election. He's a doctor by training. Including, and he served, including multiple committee assignments on the Finance Committee, the ranking member of the Health, Education, Labor, and Pensions Committee, serving on the Environment and Natural Resources Committee, and also the Veteran Affairs Committee. Senator Bennett is a senior U.S. Senator for, from Colorado, a seat he has held since 2009. He's a member of the Democratic Party. Previous experience includes working in the private sector and also serving as superintendent of Denver Public Schools. He's a member of the Finance Committee as well, where he chairs the Subcommittee on Taxation and IRS Oversight. He's also on the Select Committee on Intelligence and the Agriculture, Nutrition, and Forestry Committee. So with that, Senators, uh, absolutely delighted to have you here with us uh, this afternoon. And let me uh, begin with you, uh, Senator, uh, with both Senators, and starting with the, with the bigger picture question. Uh, Senator Cassie, I'll start with you. What do you. What's your vision behind the America's Act? What's the high-level policy outcomes that you hope to achieve through this legislation? I'll start off the high level, and then I'll just go to a little bit lower, but still high. Fantastic. I think it's been since John F. Kennedy that the United States has had a coherent policy towards the Western Hemisphere. We have suffered from that. And by we, I mean the entire Western Hemisphere. And parties change in terms of the White House. And so somebody starts something in the next four years, it changes to something else. In the next four years, it changes to something else. But more often, it's been neglect. Now, we have a Western Hemisphere, which is having lots of problems, economic growth stalled, governments being somewhat unstable. And in the United States, we see uh, literally millions of people attempting to cross our southern border without irregular migration, illegal migration, whatever you want to talk about it. So, so just let's bring it down a little bit. Um, if we think, Michael and I and others, if we could come up with this coherent policy that would encourage private investment in the Western Hemisphere, reshoring, nearshoring industries that's currently in Asia, it has the benefits that you previously spoke about, but it also has the added advantage of creating prosperity, therefore, ideally, making governments more stable making economies more resilient, making it less likely that someone leaves the, 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 the land in which they've spent generations and, and attempts to go on a very dangerous journey in which many people die to come to the United States for an uncertain future. In the meantime, as the United States exports there and we re-import, there's that virtuous cycle of capitalism where everybody's economy improves, not just the other country Whatever countries are on either side of this, not just the United States, but also fill in the blank, and not just fill in the blank, but also the United States, as we create that possibility, uh, which again is the being driven by the private sector, being driven by reshoring, um, we think there's myriads of, of benefits. I got to bring it down another level, but I'll stop and turn it over to Michael. Thank you, Senator Bennett. Your reflections on your vision for this legislation. Thank you. Thanks, Jason. I want to thank you and the Atlantic Council and the other partners for having Bill and me here today. And I want to thank everybody for tuning in. This is an incredibly important topic as we look to the future. And it is, I feel extremely grateful to share the stage with my colleague, Senator Bill Cassidy, who's shown such leadership here. Across the Western Hemisphere, we share deep, rich ties and an enormous opportunity for partnership. But as Bill said, since, since maybe as Kennedy, uh, but certainly for decades, Washington has failed to create any comprehensive policy or offer a compelling alternative to Chinese investment in the region. While we've been busy elsewhere, China has rushed to fill the void with a surge of trade, investment, and technology. We've already seen these relationships pose a long-term threat to local industries, to minerals, environment, the rule of law throughout the Western Hemisphere. And I think the Americas Act offers an opportunity for the United States to renew our partnerships across Latin America and the Caribbean and, 
embrace our values together in a shared struggle for democracy and for prosperity. Our legislation would create a pathway to bring jobs and industries that we've exported across the Pacific back to our hemisphere, an endeavor that I, I think we should prioritize, especially following the supply chain disruptions that we saw during the COVID pandemic. The America's Act would help see through our long-term goal to integrate trade and economic development through improved financing mechanisms, the Development Finance Corp Corporation, and expanding the USMCA to help elevate critical labor and environmental standards. I think that, you know, you used an example as an exception. I hope, for example, Costa Rica's long-term partnership with Intel is a, is a good example of how we can create jobs and sec secure our supply chains as a hemisphere. We should build on that progress and look for examples of other pro progress in which we can build. Between Latin America's abundant critical minerals and our abundant oil and natural gas, our hemisphere has everything it needs to achieve energy independence. We're in a position to set an example to the world of a more integrated, secure, and resilient energy infrastructure and to lead the global transition to clean energy. Nobody is better situated than we are as a hemisphere on those grounds. Finally, from labor shortages in our family farms and ranches to American nursing homes our parents and grandparents are living in, our economy depends on a hardworking labor force from across the Americas, but the United States immigration system is outdated. It doesn't meet these needs. So we need to reform the system to honor our heritage as a nation of immigrants and secure the benefits of our economy of a, with a working immigration system that honors and complies with the rule of law and gives the American people confidence that our border is secure. By creating an ever-expanding and permanent trade partnership of Western countries, we can finally take a comprehensive approach to develop long-lasting trade, climate, and immigration policy. And I think that you know, it's, as we'll get into in a minute, it's really important to me, and I know it is to Bill, that this is a bipartisan effort. And let, let me pick up on that, on that, Senator Bennett. And, and as both you and Senator Cassie said and here at the Atlantic Council, we're also focused on, on the importance of, of partnership and, and long-term policy. Uh, Senator Cassidy, uh, I've also heard uh, many much enthusiasm from my conversations with uh, various government officials around the region about about this legislation, but walk us through the, the bipartisan nature of this legislation and why nearshoring and this legislation and, and also deeper partnerships with Latin America and the Caribbean, why this has to be bipartisan in, in nature in so far as how we are conducting our foreign policy and efforts like this toward the region. Well, on the most kind of basic level, unless something has 60 votes, it cannot pass the Senate. And since neither party has more than typically 54 at a high watermark, uh, it's obviously going to be bipartisan. That's just kind of doing math. Let's talk about it conceptually. The two parties obviously represent different thinking, different wings of thinking in the United States. Michael brings something to this, a sensibility of the people whom he represents, which is a little bit nuanced relative to my sensibility. Frankly, when Bennett got on board, my staff and I were just popping the popping the corks because, <laughs> because we know it only has a chance if we have somebody thoughtful from the other party who's trying to do it with us. And what he will bring to the table, as what I will bring to the table, is how do we how do we appeal to our respective constituencies that are unique from each other's constituency? Uh, if we're going to have a political solution which transcends administrations, it means one, it has to be legislative, but two, it's got to reflect those different sensibilities. That's the most practical way about it. Yeah. And believe me, Michael's in a state in which he talks simultaneously of fossil fuel and of clean energy. I'm in a state where we, most, where we simultaneously talk of both. And we speak of uh, the trade that our states would already have with Latin America, are with Canada, because this is, you know, Western Hemisphere, not just Latin America. Um, I think our states are also kind of that duality of perspective, fossil fuel and clean energy, um, um, making sure that our workers here in our country do well, but recognizing it's not zero sum. If something is reshored from Asia to Mexico, 
there's more trade between the United States and Mexico in terms of reciprocal trade than there is between the United States and China. Put differently, we get more of those dollars back into our economy as opposed to China, which may use those dollars for Belt and Road initiatives or String of Pearl or other things that never come back to benefit the United States. So I can keep on going, but Michael's input is invaluable and we will only be successful if it is bipartisan. Thank, thank you, Senator. And I think your point as well is an excellent one on the importance of legislation from Congress to give that long-term commitment, that reliability uh, that, that regional partners are, are, are yearning for. Uh, Senator Bennett, uh, feel free to react to Senator Cassidy's comments, but as well, uh, we're, after this, I'm going to have a panel with a few ministers from Central America uh, from their perspectives on the importance of nearshoring. I'd like for your comments as well on the importance on how nearshoring could be beneficial from a regional perspective in your viewpoint. Well, thanks for that. And let me let me just first react to what Bill said, because I think it was such an, uh, an emphatic uh, uh, and useful description of the nature of pluralism. You know, in a democracy, we're, we're not we're not supposed to agree with each other all the time. That's not the point, because there isn't a king or a tyrant to tell us what to think. You know, and the idea is that we're going to come together, not in some shabby compromise necessarily in the middle, but we take our different perspectives, our different interests, our different geographies that Bill laid out so well, and out of those, we create a result that's more imaginative than any king or tyrant could come up with their own, and I would say durable because we're going to pass a piece of legislation so we can make sure that it endures from uh, from generation to generation. I think that's really important. That's a, that's a set of values around pluralism that's critically important, not just the United States, but to other countries in this region. And we have to figure out how to lift that up. And I do think that that topic, the topic of bipartisanship, of nearshoring and partnership that you raised, Jason, are all different parts of the same puzzle. I would say to the panelists who are representing Guatemala and Panama and Costa Rica after this session, that by virtue of our intertwined cultures and history and proximity, we are often affected by the same forces, you know, and what the America's Act allows us to do is take different elements, such as trade and investment, people to people exchanges, create a comprehensive and resilient mechanism of integration and cohesion that will enable our hemisphere to thrive together, which is the only way we can actually thrive. And I think the importance of nearshoring can't be overstated. You know, we're living at a time when the first time really since the 1980s, the United States has finally passed a bill to bring back an industry, the semiconductor industry, back to the U.S. There's still a ton of work to do, even for the semiconductor supply chain. But through collaboration with our Western allies, we can bring back more industries, to the US, U.S., I think, and create even more jobs and economic opportunities for the entire hemisphere, as Bill was also saying. And as I mentioned earlier, I think, you know, the Chinese government, Beijing, has taken full advantage of, you know, our, the lack of attention that the United States has paid to the Western hemisphere. And it shows, you know, since 2000, trade between Beijing and Latin America has grown from almost $12 billion to $445 billion, nearly 40 times. Beijing is now the top trading partner for all of South America and second only to the U.S. for all of Latin America. And I know this is a bipartisan yeah. concern. The question is, what are we going to do about it? Yeah. And that's what we're talking about, creating new jobs, increasing people-to-people -people exchanges, growing international trade and opportunity, and countering Beijing's growing influence over global manufacturing and geopolitics by uniting democracies in our hemisphere. These are all bipartisan foreign policy goals. They're going to stand the test of crime. I just want to highlight one other critical pillar of the America's Act, and then I'll stop, and that's the people-to-people -people partnerships. More than 60 million Americans of, nor of people living in the United States are of Hispanic descent. The United States is the fourth largest Spanish-speaking country in the world. The America's Act recognizes our nation's diverse nature and creates additional visa opportunities and cultural and educational affairs programming to further strengthen and support the networks and programs and families that unite his, this hemisphere. So I am extremely glad to continue this work with Senator Cassidy and her partners across the region so we don't go another 50 years and look back on what 
could have been. What right now, I'm extremely hopeful looking toward the future with the Americas Act, the vast opportunity that we have together to build a prosperous, safe, and free hemisphere. That's important to us, but it's really important to our kids and our grandkids. Uh, thank you so much, Senators. Uh, we have just a two minutes left here, and I want to ask you a last question. What's next? Uh, lots of excitement about, about the Americas Act, uh, 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 addressing a lot of longstanding concerns and, and, and uh, untapped opportunities, frankly, across the hemisphere. Uh, what, what, are the, what are going to be the next steps on your from your perspectives? Yeah, so if I may, Michael. Um, sure, please do. Michael and I are both speaking to our respective, like I'm speaking to Republicans, he's speaking to Democrats, but we can speak each other to others um, to try and line up support. Uh, we are speaking to the administration. Uh, we're speaking to some of the panelists you will have and other representatives of countries. This is not the United States saying, hey, listen, we're going we're gonna to do this for you. This is both sides saying this is how we can work together. And we think that's how it's more likely to be effective. In fact, that's the only way it's going to be effective. So now it is a process of both socialization and attracting support. Uh, we'd like to dovetail with that which the administration has already laid out. Frankly, I think we've got a little bit more detail, but I think we're operating within the same paradigm where it's a partnership. And in that partnership, both sides work together, not just rhetorically, but in reality, one point on that, by the way, because uh, because Michael mentioned the people to people, and we've talked about the nearshoring and reshoring, a neat governance system in, in which, in your opening remarks, Jason, you mentioned how there's a concern <clears throat> um, about a company which may wish to invest, of whether or not they'll be able to get the permits without having to pay consideration to some you know low-level bureaucrat sort of thing. And that scares them away. They've got certain ethics codes. We, we're going to propose, it would have to be adopted, an e-governance system in which, um, just like they do in some countries around the world, you would go online to file your permits. If you're going to contract with a subcontractor, you would go online to see if he or she has filed their necessary paperwork. And it removes that kind of level of bureaucracy. It lowers the cost. It makes it more likely that a company will enter into the formal economy as opposed to being in the informal. Once they're in the formal economy, they're more likely to pay taxes, which increases the amount of money the government has to pay for both social capital and physical infrastructure, which then attracts more foreign direct investment. It is a virtuous cycle that benefits both the investor, but the country, and more specifically, the people of the country. So that's another one of our pillars, and we think that sets the stage for the reshoring and the nearshoring, because now, oh my gosh, I can set up there and not worry about my permits. I, I see investment into physical infrastructure and into social capital uh, because they now have an expanded tax base, and they have that because more companies are in the formal economy, and to complete the circle, it's because we now have an e-governance system of which the investor is able to participate as well. So it's one of our pillars, which we think very much enables the um, nearshoring that we've been discuss discussing. Thank, thank you so much, Senator Cassidy. Senator Bent, would you like to add anything before we cl uh, close here? I would only add that I think that um, in many ways, we're, the wind is at our back here. There, there is a real desire uh, among the American people for us to address the issues that Bill and I have been talking about today. I think there's an understanding that uh, the economic integration of the hemisphere is something that could be power, a powerful job creator for not just the United States, but for everybody, that issues that are related to the migration issues that Bill talked about are going to be difficult to address in the in you know without the broader context being addressed that our national security are also you know are, um, of concern so i think there are a lot of reasons to think that we can build momentum here and so what we have to now do is the hard work of legislating by adding colleagues um, from the republican party and the democratic party onto this bill and we're going to continue to do that and make sure that the administration here comes to see this as a, a positive step forward for us. And I think the work, you know, that the land council and others can do to, 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 to push the effort that Bill Cassidy and I are involved in here, we would deeply appreciate because I think that it's a, it's a piece of legislation that's been given a lot of consideration 
And if we can get it passed, I think there's no end to the distance that we're all going to be able to travel together. So thank you for having me. Thank you. Thank you. On that point, thank you so much, Senator Bennett, Senator Cassidy, uh, here at the Atlantic Council. I mentioned at the outset uh, this commitment from turning near shoring from rhetoric into reality uh, is, a, is a, a new drive of, of our work at the uh, Adrian Arch Latin America Center. So I thank you so much for coming on, uh, joining us, and look forward to uh, the follow up. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Now, coming up, a uh, conversation with ministers from Central America on advancing public-private opportunities for nearshoring. And then we'll take the rest of the hour and look at nearshoring progress and trends and look, then zoom out and looking at uh, nearshoring on an evolving global context. Now, for this next conversation, from nearshoring to reality, advancing public-private collaboration, I'd like to welcome our five speakers, uh, one of whom is actually joining me here in studio, here in Washington, Teresa Carlson, and our other speakers joining us from Guatemala, Panama, Costa Rica, and Miami. I'm going to go ahead now and welcome all of our speakers and go ahead and introduce them. Uh, first, uh, Guatemala's Minister of our Economy, Janiel Rosales, uh, is joining us. He has been in his current role for almost uh, one and a half years, Minister, um, and has more than 20 years of experience in different productive areas in multinational uh, companies. So, bienvenido, welcome, Mr. Rosales. We're also joined by Panama's Minister of Trade and Industry, Federico Alfaro, uh, who actually just celebrated, I think, about a week ago, Minister, uh, your one year in your current position, uh, and was previously president of the Board of Directors of Tucumán International Airport and also Deputy Minister of Foreign Affairs. We're also joined on screen by Costa Rica's Vice Minister of Foreign Trade, Indiana Trejos, uh, who also serves as the president of the National Council for Trade Facilitation and brings over 20 years of experience in trade investment and market access. We're also joined on screen here by Millicom's EVP and Chief External Affairs Officer, Kareem Lasima, who represents one of the most important foreign investors in Central America. Millicon's work is critical for the region's economic competitiveness, employment, and livelihood, and is thus a champion in working with the Atlantic Council on advancing the conditions for nearshoring. And then I'm uh, also uh, pleased to be joined here in studio by Flexport's president and chief commercial officer, and also Atlantic Council board member, uh, Teresa Carlson. Uh, she represents a global leader in supply chain technology, spearheading the country's, uh, the company's expansion, new global markets, verticals, and strategic partnerships. Uh, so over the next 30 minutes, we will look at Central America's nearshoring opportunities, supply chain logistics, and how to attract investment, all with a public-private lens. And I'm going to go ahead and start with the ministers on screen first. And Minister Rostales, I'm going to start with you. Um, lately, there's been many discussions about nearshoring toward the region, and we uh, have focused on manufacturing in Mexico or maybe the importance of critical minerals in South America. But how would you make the case for Central America, especially to those currently overlooking Central America as a nearshoring destination? And also, in your answer, feel free to respond to some of the uh, points that were made by both Senators Cassidy and Bennett in the previous conversation. Uh, thanks a lot, first, uh, to the Atlantic Council for the invitation, and especially to you, uh, Jason. Yes, uh, I, I think that Central America offers significant advantages as a near shoring destination that are often overlooked. Uh, by highlighting these advantages and focusing on regional integration and collaboration, we think that uh, can collectively advance uh, through this business case and, and convert, really, the region in the, the near shoring uh, potential that we think it has. Uh, so here are some points to consider when making the case for Central America and specifically for Guatemala that has a stronger economy in the region. First of all, Guatemala uh, has the largest market in Central America. We are around 94 billion. Exports in the last three years were around 40.2 billion. Uh, imports are, were around 76 uh, billion. And Central America has also a position as an important investing destination. For instance, uh, like uh, you said, uh, we are close to the market of U.S. and Mexico. And now, uh, specifically, that uh, Mexico is also facing some security challenges, we are also having a new opportunity for our investors that want to come to, to our countries. Uh, also, the Guatemalan uh, government is one of the few uh, pro-investment and pro-business governments left in the region. So we think that uh, our president has led an economic strategy that has positioned Guatemala also as an attractive investing destination. Uh, recently, not only uh, our good friends from Millicom have invested uh, uh, a lot of billions in Guatemala, but also we are getting companies from India, 
from Qatar, from, from Taiwan, from Japan, from the U.S. So we think that we are the natural allies of the, the uh, of, uh, United States and also for the U.S. government. So as the two uh, senators were, were saying, we think that we should uh, focus on not only um, alliances regarding uh, economics, but also people to people, because at the end of the day, what we want is more trade and, and aid. And uh, we are the best allies uh, left in the region. So I think that we, we should uh, focus on the different alliances that we have already been going. For instance, Costa Rica, Guatemala, Panama, Dominicana, we have already um, some dialogues regarding near shortage. So I think that uh, if we enforce these type of mechanisms, uh, sooner or later we're going to have the outcomes and we're going to make America safe. Thank you so much, Minister. And I should also mention to you that your, uh, your ambassador, Ambassador Quinones, is here joining us uh, live in studio. Maybe I should have mentioned that before you, uh, you gave your, your answer. Uh, but uh, thank you so much for that. I want to go to uh, Minister uh, uh, Alfaro um, and then Vice Minister Trejo. So it was semiconductors. Semiconductors have been the center of reshoring and nearshoring discussions uh, here in Washington, and both uh, Panama and Costa Rica are engaged uh, in the space. Costa Rica, of course, and uh, mentioned previously, the long history working with Intel. Uh, also, Mr. Alfaro, your, your uh, ambassador here in Washington, uh, uh, Ramon Martinez, recently wrote about the opportunities Panama offers for chip makers. How is your ministry, I'll start with you, Mr. Alfaro, how is your ministry working with its U.S. counterpart and also the industry writ large to advance a hemispheric chip agenda. Feel free to also make any comments with regard to what the senators mentioned in their previous conversation as well. Well, th thank you, Jason, for the invitation. Um, and uh, I will also extend my um, hello to uh, the current uh, minister of Guatemala, the vice minister of Costa Rica. Um, I think I'll, I'll start first by um, addressing the previous panel, which was Senator Cassidy and Senator Bennett. I think it's important that they have stated, first of all, that they're doing a bipartisan um, um, legislative agenda, which I think is very important, but it's also very comforting for countries such as Panama, such as Costa Rica, such as Guatemala, to know that they have a partner both in the executive and in the legislative branch. And we know the importance that um, bipartisan rep bipartisanship represents um, to these initiatives. So I think um, it'll be very important um, for us to continue our dialogue with the legislative branch, with Senator uh, Cassidy, which we have a very longstanding relationship with, because we strongly believe that these alliances in the region, especially for democratic countries, stable economic countries, such as Panama, such as Guatemala, such as Costa Rica, such as the Rep uh, Dominican Republic, all, obviously all that, uh, I think, um, enhances, but also represents uh, a win-win, both for Panama, both for Costa Rica, for Guatemala, but also for the interests of the United States. Um, coming back to your second question, obviously the disruption of global supply chains is a unique opportunity for democratic countries in the region. Um, we believe that Panama um, can position itself as a key player in industries that could catalyze, catalyze economic growth and prosperity. Costa Rica and Panama are two countries that stand to win from this movement of supply chain. Um, but it is also Panama's vision that one country participating in the supply chain could be an anomaly, but two or three countries participating from the region in the supply chain um, can create a cluster. Both Panama and Costa Rica play a larger role in this supply chain. And it's also very important that Central America in general and Panama and Costa Rica specifically could become a new epicenter for semiconductors. Um, and together, obviously, our aim is to compete with some of the South, Southeast Asian um, countries that provide an alternative. Thank I'll you. talk to you a little bit about Panama, specifically Panama. Panama is a hub. Um, uh, we consider a hub of hubs. And our objective in this supply chain is clear, to become a regional hub for the assembly, testing, and packaging of chips. We have our infrastructure. We have a connectivity that sets us apart in this regard. And the role of Global Hub is one that Panama is equipped to play, not only in the short term, but also in the medium and long term. Thank you. And Vice Minister Reyes, let me get your uh, comments as well on uh, opportunities for Costa Rica to uh, further build on uh, its history and being a, 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 a destination, uh, building off the history with, with Intel. How are you looking at working with U.S. counterparts? Uh, and also feel free to re reflect on the comments made thus far. We can't, uh, you, you might be on mute. 
Okay, now there we go. I can hear you. Yep. Hi, Jason. Thank you for for having me, and hello to everyone in the in the panel. Um, as as mentioned before, these are very interesting times for us in Latin America. And as the senators mentioned, we should see this as opportunities to create prosperity in the region, which helps our countries be more stable and cater many um, uh, many social needs that we have, and also to to develop on our uh, on achieving a more inclusive gro growth and, and sustainable development. Costa Rica has done very well amid amid this um, volatile and uncertain times, and our resilience has been met with new and very interesting opportunities for us. This includes uh, possibilities to attract new investments. And um, considering the careful attention that has been, has been given to diversifying supply chains, especially in the semiconductor industry, um, this means uh, that we can secure and decrease any associated uh, risks. Um, Costa Rica has much to offer in support of supply chains that are driven by reshoring and nearshoring for the reasons that um, the previous ministers have mentioned, because we are strategically located in the region. We have Costa Rica has connectivity to all major global markets, to so an extensive network of free trade agreements and investment agreements that cover more than two thirds of global GDP. Uh, we also have a stable and political, uh, a stable uh, and political economy. And um, we have qualified human talent. And that has def uh, definitely been a differentiator for Costa Rica. So uh, concretely, what have we been doing during these times? Um, we have been strengthening our ties with top level companies that manufacture semiconductors in order to capitalize on their knowledge and listen to their needs. We have an ongoing dialogue both in San Jose and in Washington with these. And this input is crucial in designing policy and future strategies. Fantastic. Thank you. Oh, th thank you so much, Vice Minister. I want to move on to uh, the uh, really important, uh, the, the importance you're saying as far as Costa Rica's work with the private sector specifically, right? And how you're having these consistent dialogues. And I want to bring in the two, two members of the private sector who are joining us uh, on this panel. Uh, start with you, Kareem. Um, we've, we've heard from both ministers and the vice minister about this, about the importance of, pri of, of nearshoring. Millicom is deeply committed to digital broader economic development in Central America. Uh, you, we, you, we've also worked together on starting this nearshoring working group. So why, why is this near, why is nearshoring so important to the work of, of Millicom? And then also, how can countries in the region draw greater attention and also get more investor confidence so the companies like Millicom further their uh, investments in the region? Look, thanks, uh, Jason, and thanks to everybody. You know, I think uh, having three of my core ministers and core countries in which we invest, you know, obviously Guatemala, as Minister Rosada said, we, we went uh, heavy with, with the investment there in the past three years, showing how much we believe in the country. But Panama and Costa Rica are also great examples uh, of our commitment to the region. And uh, so this is great. And I hope they're all using a very nice Tigo connection because everything works perfectly there. So I just hope <laughs> that's the case. <laughs> Let's see. But look, this is the reality here, right? We are, we believe in, uh, in this one near shoring exercise. And I want really to thank Jason and all his team for starting this project because I think it's a huge priority for obviously for DC and for the US, but for each of our countries, uh, especially in all Central America. If you think to it, I've been hearing a lot about. Uh, uh, you know, the obviously the, the word semiconductor, but think to uh, all the rest of the sector, things to automotive, things to textile, things to pharmaceutical, things to renewable energy. We're talking about a huge opportunity. If I see what happened in the past a year and a half in Guatemala, uh, with all the new investments coming constantly, uh, that almost help us, I would not say justify, but show that our investment has been really the right thing because there is more and more interest and more of these country companies, this requires connectivity. Uh, and, you know, this is exactly what we want to do, is to continue to connect uh, our region uh, into the global supply chain and to help a big multinational, but also uh, multi-Latinas or other companies to start looking at the opportunities that is represented by our countries. Also, connectivity, I think, is going also to help us in focusing on one of the most important parts of the assurance, the human capital. 
because with connectivity, you have access to a very higher level of education because you don't have any more uh, to travel specifically to the US or Europe, but you can have access to that education from where you are. And we know how human capital is essential uh, in order to justify uh, that near shore. We need more and more trained people, not only on the language, but also on the skills from semiconductor, but also imagine pharmaceutical, how technical uh, the challenges are. So for us, really, this is the top priority. Plus, the most beautiful thing for me is this, regional approach. I think each of our countries have huge advantages. You know, some are more uh, on the manufacturing, some will be more on the intellectual. But the most important thing is to have a regional approach, at least to the common-minded uh, uh, countries, let's call it like them, uh, that allow us to develop an offer for those companies that wants to uh, you know, invest or decided to put more investment into our region. That's the most important part, and this is where uh, public and private work essential uh, in order to de develop this attraction. And then final point, and I think Minister Rosanna has really insisted on that one. We need to convince people that the region is a huge opportunity and not only a risk of threat or a problem. The reality is that there is a huge opportunity for all the Americas uh, to invest more and more in the region in order to help uh, tackling some of the challenges that we see here more in the U.S. on the immigration side and et cetera. I think we need, it's a win-win that we really need to focus all together uh, in order to help the region to grow even more than what it is today. Thank, thank you, Kareem. Uh, I know Mr. Rosales has to uh, uh, leave to attend to an urgent matter, so I want to thank you, Mr. Rosales. Before, uh, I'm going to turn it to, to Teresa in a moment, uh, but uh, would you like to add anything before you leave and I turn back to Teresa? Well, no, just uh, thank you for the invitation, and I agree totally uh, about uh, what uh, the colleagues were saying, especially uh, Minister Federico Alfaro. Uh, I think that we should work together and be more competitive as a region, and uh, we should focus on that because at the end of the day, you know, uh, our economy is going to grow and these type of alliances are in great need for, for the development of our economy. So I want to congratulate the Atlantic Council for this great event. And uh, every time uh, you invite me, I'm going to be there. So thank you a lot. Fantastic. Well, thank you. So, thank you so much. Uh, Teresa, let me let me go to you. You've you've uh, heard from the ministers. Uh, I saw you yes. nodding your head as yeah. they were speaking, as Kareem was speaking as well. Uh, boosting Latin America's success in nearshoring and trade, of course, requires improved logistics, uh, supply chain management, uh, trade financing. Uh, these are all areas in which Flexport works. Yes. Um, from your perspective of Flexport and your and your clients, which of these areas present the biggest opportunities and the frank and also the more also the biggest uh, some of the biggest challenges as well. Uh, for companies to export to the region. Well, let me, by the way, thank you for having me. This is a great event. And just to give you a little bit of context, Flexport, we're a global supply chain and logistics company. We work, we do work around the globe and we're actively expanding into Latin America, which is going to be a really important part of the world, I think. It'll be a growing important part of the world in terms of supply chain and logistics. And one of the things that struck me in the conversations was your tone around partnerships. Yeah and inclusivity, because I do believe kind of my experience of 25 years running around the world, mainly as a technology executive, I found that when regions can work together on these big issues, it makes them a lot stronger. Because if you think about uh, in the world of global supply chain and logistics, this is an industry that actually has not moved forward. Um, you know, Jason, I've known you for a while. My, my background was Amazon and Microsoft. And during the world of cloud, we would go around the world. And there was, especially during COVID, there was a lot of digital transformation going on, especially if you think about governments or these industries that had to find ways to get to their customers or constituents, and they couldn't get into their data centers or to their offices. It drove digital transformation. In supply chain and logistics, it actually did not. It did not drive that because they were so busy. Uh, they didn't take the time to do the digital transformation that was really required. So now we're seeing that begin to change. And I think it's an opportunity uh, as well for Latin America, because when you talk about skills, you can also think about technology skills that are required, not yeah. just these other skills around uh, public works and infrastructure and financing, those are, of course, going to be key to success. But also just the fact that technology skills, because supply chain and logistics, 
you need the trekkers, you need the, the individuals on the ground, the labor workers, but you're also going to need technology workers. So I would say, you know, it's a great opportunity. The idea of working collaboratively and looking for opportunities to bring companies in like Flexport, we're like, who do we go talk to? Yeah. How do we work? And last, one last thing I'll say is partnerships are going to be so critical because companies like us need to go in and get the right partnerships to move those goods mm -hmm. around. And just a follow-up question for uh, Teresa on partnerships. How can, what do, what's your advice on how governments can most effectively partner with companies like Flexport and, and joint efforts toward actually converting nearshoring into, into reality? Well, I think there's, there's two parts. Dialogues like these are important, but also helping us understand who's on their radar. Like who are their, who in their countries are you know, who's the trekking companies? Who's the retail companies? Who needs our help? And some of the areas, if you think about electronics, uh, retail, fashion, what are the types of goods moving in and out of Latin America? Then we need to, like, we need to connect ourselves with those retailers, but also then work with small business partners. Because again, I'll, I'll just say, if you're going in, you've got to know all the small trekking companies too. You just don't want big conglomerates yeah. that creates small business opportunities as well as larger ones. But also, you know, if there's, if there's programs they can do around policy that helps you get into the countries easier and then move cross-border. Cross-border is critical. Yeah. And anything today that we're moving goods, trucks have to move those goods, not just, uh, you know, ocean freighters and air. And air. Yeah, fantastic, Teresa. Let me turn back to you, uh, Minister Alfaro. Uh, in addition, to looking ahead, uh, in addition to CHIPS, Panama has also ambitious plans for other opportunities like uh, uh, greenshoring. What type of new proposals or incentives from the U.S. government could better position Panama and the region as a greenshore destination, but also writ large? I mentioned in the beginning of my comments the importance of the combination of domestic pull factors to bring in nearshoring and also international push factors. We talked the international push with the conversation with the senators, but from your perspective, um, uh, what types of um, new proposals, what kind of incentives from your, could really uh, attract that investment that's so necessary uh, into Panama? Well, let me just say this first. I think um, both um, Kareem and Teresa have have nailed nailed it in the head. I think number one, um, uh, Central American countries and Milicom has obviously great experience with dealing with Central American countries, with what with Costa Rica, with Guatemala, and with um, Panama. They have made important investments in Panama. They have. Um, also allocated additional funds to increase investments. And why do they do that? They do that because, first, they believe in the country, but we also have a mindset that, from a government perspective, we have to facilitate private investments. Um, we have to make sure that companies feel secure from a legal and an investment point of view. We have to make sure that there is the legal framework there available for countries to continue to invest in Panama. Um, and I believe we have done so. We have, um, um, I think, investment opportunities. We have our legal framework. But I think Teresa has also mentioned something important that is collaborate with other countries in the region and with um, uh, private companies. When we talk about collaborating with other countries in the region, um, we all can bring something to the table. Panama, as you know, um, has the Panama Canal. Over 6% of world trade, world commerce goes through the Panama Canal. We have important infrastructure when it comes to um, um, ports, for example. And that's what we bring to the table. Costa Rica has human resources. Guatemala um, has obviously other important um, things to bring to the table when it comes to manufacturing, for example. So the region has to think of itself not as isolated countries, but of what as a region as a whole we bring to the country, we bring to the table. Right. But I think it's also important to bring your attention to green shoring, as you said. Um, Panama is a green leader, one of the only three carbon negative countries in the world. And also important to mention, a blue leader with over 50% of our oceans declared protective areas. That has become because this government, but also this generation of new leaders believe that climate and sustainability are central and must be central to our economic development strategy. And we want to ensure that as we move closer to advanced economic status, that we keep in mind what really matters, which is building sustainable future for our citizens. Our impact on climate action 
is not only local, but global. This year, for example, and I'll give you certain examples, we hosted our own Oceans Conference, where representatives from over 190 countries made 361 new commitments, valued at more than $21.22 billion to protect the world's ocean. The Panama Canal, since its conception, has aimed to close the gap in the maritime industry, offering a route with a shorter navigation time, resulting in cost reductions, supplies, fuel, and consequently, less carbon dioxide emissions. Mr. Alfaro, Mr. those are excellent points. Uh, I want to make sure we have, we're just uh, about to conclude this panel. I want to make sure to bring in Vice Minister Trejos and Kareem uh, one last time here. Uh, Vice Minister Trejos, I want to ask you about uh, USMCA. Uh, Costa Rica has been interested in, in, in uh, an entry into USMCA. How would, some, how would the formal integration of Costa Rica, maybe even its mem members, uh, uh, into that agreement, how would that expand nearshoring oppor opportunities? And I'll, maybe if you could uh, take about a minute on that question, that'd be great. Thank you. Um, we see USMCA as the natural way forward to consolidate our trade and investment relation with the United States. CAFTA, as you know, is, is old. It's probably it's like six, 16 years old. So we need to uh, modernize our, our framework. And USMCA provides the high standards and modern rules, modern rules that we, we need for our industries to thrive. Also, Costa Rica has evolved from a country that exported just a few products to more than uh, 4,000 4, products to more than 150 countries around the world. And 50% of our goods exports are destined to the North America market. So it makes sense to consolidate and improve our um, trade um, framework, our trade normative. And in that sense, um, to accumulate origin with Mexico and Canada and to have the same rules and standards. So we see uh, the USMCA as the right vehicle to move forward and upgrade our trade relations with the United States. Uh, will we secure a better position as a trusted and secure supplier of key products for the United States? Um, we have talked to U.S. companies, to business groups, to think tanks, among others, and we have found enormous support for this idea. We know it will take time, um, uh, but we're happy to see uh, Senator Cassidy and Bennett uh, sponsoring, of course, the, the Americas Act, and to know that there is um, some support from from uh, Congress and and the Senate for this proposal. Um, so we definitely see this as a way to move forward, and uh, we believe we believe it, it would be a good message for the international community, and an addition for a, a trusted to see Costa Rica as a trusted friend to the North American market. F fantastic, thank you, Kareem. I'm going to go to you on the last the last question here about infrastructure and the importance of of high quality digital infrastructure and. Uh, and so far as advancing uh, uh, the efficient flow of goods and services, why is why is this so critical? And and also any last uh, comments as we wrap up the panel here. Look, I think the example of this event is why it is so critical, right? Uh, if you look at Panama, uh, you see how critical connectivity and infrastructure is. You know, often when we think about infrastructure, we think to uh, roads and uh, bridges, but we forget most of the time the digital connectivity that is essential. Just if you go to the Panama Canal and you visit it, you will be impressed by how much technology there is in every uh, piece of the of the World Canal. And it's incredible how supply chain is managed. And this is coming from connectivity. But this is really one of the most important parts. Let's not talk about my former employer a long time ago, Intel in Costa Rica, that is a great example of really what can be done uh, in a country like Costa Rica. But look, let me, I, I just want to finalize on a few points. You know, I, I talked about human capital. Okay, and I really want to insist on three other points on which the uh, uh, the companies really look at for uh, for investment. You know, at distance it's important, and I think this we have it uh, very well. Permissive loans, or the loans that are pro business, like Minister Alfaro would say, this is very important because most of the time there is a misconception of what's going on in our countries. And I think that's one of the most interesting parts. You know, it's. Guatemala, Panama, Costa Rica are incredibly pro-business uh, uh, countries that have been doing a great job. And this is one of the reasons why we have been investing so much in the three countries. And I think with the right policies, Latin America and specifically Central America can become, uh, uh, can become even more attractive for the investment uh, of uh, you know, companies that are still not there. 
I think the more we establish uh, the whole concept of rule of law, institutionality, and pro-business framework, the more we are going to attract. And it's like a snowball effect. You know, we started seeing some of the investments we saw with our investment in Guatemala attracted more and more investments. So what we have to be sure is that the snowball effect doesn't get blocked. Uh, you know, that we work all together in order to continue to push this. And this is one of the reasons uh, we are so happy to support this project that uh, Jason and his team and the World Happy Council has been launching because we need to do more. And I hope we will be able to get more people coming to support and working with us because the more we talk about it, the more we are going to see the incredible attractiveness that has our region. Thank I'm very, very, very proud to be an investor in this region. Thank you. Thank you so thank much, you. Kareem. I want to, I want to again, thank uh, uh, you, you, Mr. Alfaro, Vice Minister Trejos, uh, Kareem, Teresa, uh, of course, Mr. Rosales, who's already left us. I think these first two conversations have already uh, elaborated on what, we, what I mentioned in the beginning, the importance of both international push factors, as the Senator spoke about insofar as incentivizing nearshoring, but also the domestic pull factors uh, insofar as bringing business uh, and, uh, uh, to Central America uh, and to the hemisphere writ large. So thank you very much to all of you. We're going to now take a two-minute break and be back with our our next panel, moderated by Adrian Arch Latin America Center Senior Fellow, Pepe Zhang. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Pepe Zan. I'm senior fellow at the Adrian Arch Latin America Center here at the Atlantic Council. What a pleasure and what a tough act to follow after these very high-level panels that we just had with two U.S. senators and, of course, uh, two ministers from Central America and a vice minister from Central America, and, of course, bringing in the private sector perspective. In the next two final, uh, panels, we're going to continue along this three-pronged approach that Jason has laid out at the beginning. First of all, international push factors plus the domestic, the domestic pull factors in the region. Second, public-private collaboration. And third and finally, long-term vision combined with short-term results. And this is one of these panels we're going to get into more of the specifics of every single one of these topics. Uh, great to be uh, joined by a hybrid panel here to with distinguished panelists here uh, in person, of course, two panelists as well virtually. Now, the only thing we'll be slightly, doing slightly differently in this panel that we're going to move from the Central American region into Mexico, North America, and of course, explore some of the rest of the region as well. Um, we'll start with a question to you, Patrick, joined by you, Patrick Vandenbosch here in the, uh, in, the, in the Atlantic Council office. Patrick is a partner with Carney, and Carney has been doing this amazing reshoring index annually. Love to hear more about that. An excellent resource that's global in, scale, in scope, database, and just thinking through some of the tough issues and what are some of the myths and facts that are happening in the reshoring in the global context. So my question to you, Patrick, first of all, is based on your reshoring index, which you do, again, annually, do you think that in recent years the nearshoring trends have indeed picked up, or do you think it's more of a hype? And second part of that question is, within this global is Latin America and the Caribbean performing? Uh, well, the answer is yes, but. There's a little but. Right. Uh, so for the yes part, uh, I think a number, uh, number of facts have, have shown that uh, clearly Mexico imports into the U.S. are on a serious uptick. So if you go back to just before COVID, and now uh, the imports from Mexico into the U.S. have gone up by about 
26 percent. Uh, and in fact, Mexico is around 100 billion below China still, but you know, has caught up quite a bit over time. Uh, secondly, FDI in the first quarter of 2023 in, China, in uh, Mexico has gone up 48 percent versus last year. So there's also money being put into Mexico. And therefore, we expect uh, imports further to increase. Um, and then, of course, uh, many of our clients are increasingly trying to shorten their supply chain uh, because of all the COVID reasons we've talked about, but also now that capital's gotten more important and more costly. Uh, tying your, uh, your products uh, up on the ocean for six to eight weeks is, is starting to become a pricey uh, endeavor. Um, and then, of course, um, we've also heard from CEOs as part of our study uh, that they are increasingly being asked by their boards to continue to, continue to evaluate nearshoring and reshoring. Uh, in fact, 71% of uh, the CEOs that we asked uh, said that that was the case versus 38 last year. So that's a significant increase. So all these things to me tell me that, yes, nearshoring is definitely uh, on its way up. Um, the butt part. Uh, so for that, we need to look back a little bit to the last 10 years, and that's the time frame that we've used in this reshoring index study. And what you've seen is that actually the share of China's import into the U.S. has actually come down as a share, not as an absolute dollar amount. That's actually continued to go up. But if you look relatively as a share, it has come down. And the first five years, 2013 to 2018, it went down by a couple of percentage points. And Vietnam was one of the major countries that benefited from that. But if you look more carefully, 95% of the new capital and, in, and the new capacity that's in Vietnam can be tied to China, and to Chinese capital, um, or to Chinese companies. So, um, OK, good. Um, now then, in 2018, things started to change a little bit. Trade tariffs were put in place. And we saw a further decline, but now much more accelerated. So the share of, of China in imports in the US came down five times faster in those last five years. And as a result of that, the other Asia countries couldn't quite pick up capacity as quickly. And so companies started to look for alter alternates. And that's why you see now Mexico uh, and also US reshoring starting to, to pick up quite a bit. Um, but one of the things that's interesting about that is also Chinese companies are part of that equation. And in fact, we talked to a bunch of shelter companies who are saying that they're seeing the amount of activity of companies looking to invest in, in Mexico go up five, six times in the last 12 to 18 months. But half of those are Chinese companies. So uh, what I would say is we got to be careful that we're not moving out of China. We're still not moving away from China. Thank you, Patrick. And just so great to, you know, after the high level conversation, be able to bring it down to the specific level. Great to hear the annual changes that you've seen so far over the last decade. And of course, bringing to new more nuances, including Chinese investment into region in some of the manufacturing uh, capacities and, and possibilities. Uh, I would like to turn over the next question to, to Luz Maria de la Mora, who's on the screen. Uh, Luz Maria is a uh, non-resident senior fellow with the Atlantic Council's Adrian R. Slamaker Center. And thank you, Luz Maria. You're calling from, uh, I believe where you are, it's 11 o'clock at night. So really appreciate your commitment. You're just such an expert on this issue. I want to ask you specifically about Mexico. Um, and tying along with what Jason said earlier, specifically the point about domestic pull factors. We know that Mexico is a manufacturing powerhouse. But specifically in, the term, in, in, in terms of nearshoring, what has Mexico done so far, whether that's policy-wise, reform-wise, to attract nearshoring investment? And perhaps more importantly, what else can be done? Sure. Well, uh, thank you so much, uh, Pepe for having me today with you guys on such a, a timely topic. Thank you for, for the opportunity to share with you. Uh, well, pull factors, what are they? Pull factors are several. I, I think that one of them, and very important, has to do with the U.S.-Mexico-Canada agreement, USMCA, along with Mexico's network of uh, free trade agreements, the total 14 with 51 countries in the world. Uh, the USMCA offers the framework of clear, product, predictable, and long-term rules that offer certainty for investors and producers in the manufacturing sectors, agricultural services, and the digital economy. I think that a second pull factor is a high-level economic dialogue that Mexico has put in place with the United States and Canada. And why do I say this? The agenda items of, the, of both high-level economic dialogues include, on one hand, uh, strengthening the Mexico-U.S. Uh, border issues, um, strengthening 
um, cross-border trade, including the restructuring of supply chains. A second high-level economic dialogue issue has to do with workforce development. A third one has to do with the economy of the future, including 5G, cybersecurity, among others. And the fourth has to do with the development of southern Mexico, where we have the development of the transoceanic train to connect the Pacific and the Gulf from Santa Cruz, uh, San, Salina Cruz, I'm sorry, in Oaxaca, to Coatzacoalcos in Veracruz. So that is a very important project uh, at the infrastructure level that the Mexican government is currently pushing forward. In the Mexico-Canada high-level economic dialogue, the agenda also focuses on supply chain restructuring and creating an environment conducive to do business in North America in addition to creating an inclusive economy. I think that a third full factor for nearshoring in Mexico and in attracting more investment has to do with um, investment in transportation, like, for example, railroads. Uh, we have the example of Laredo, where a North American rail company is already offering seamless service from Canada to Mexico and also the Columbia Bridge in Oregon and Texas will offer uh, expedite services for companies, for example, in the automotive sector, but also what the current administration is doing to provide train transportation for goods and, and passengers in southern Mexico. Another factor has uh, to do with um, Mexico has a young and talented workforce. Our average age is 25 years, nine years old. But Mexico's uh, workforce is recognized as a talented and skilled one ready to participate in supply chain. Now, what more can we do? I believe that we need to improve rule of law and enforcement, uh, enforcement of USMCA commitments. We need to invest in infrastructure related to, the tra to land transportation, ports, airports, logistics, telecommunications, and 5G. So we can actually support the kinds of activities that new firms require. In addition, we need to train our human capital to adjust to the innovations in the market, such as, for example, biotech, um, artificial intelligence, nanotechnology. And last but not least, I think we, that we cannot politicize the border. It is important that politicians do not take the border as hostage of domestic political agendas, especially during election times, because we cannot block the border and we have to facilitate cross-border trade. Thank you. Thank you, Luth Maria, for your insights as always. And, and Luth Maria, before becoming a non-resident senior fellow at the Atlantic Council, was until very recently the Undersecretary for Foreign Trade in Mexico. Uh, I want to turn it over back now to the to the studio here, joined by uh, Das uh, Wells, and Das uh, Deputy Assistant Secretary Wells is in charge of um, the Southern Cone, Brazil and Southern Cone, if Indian Affairs and Economic Policy Issues. Quite a full play here uh, at the U.S. State Department within the Western Hemisphere Bureau. Uh, and I would like to ask you and also the other speakers to, to keep your remarks relatively short as we move forward. Um, but the question here is more about international push factors, right? Luz Maria told us a little bit about the domestic pull factors that we see on the Mexican side. So turning this question to you, thinking about what the U.S. can do. We've heard it from the senators, we've heard it from the, their ministers and officials from the region about some of these issues. And I think about, for example, the America's Partnership for Economic Prosperity. I think about the Inflation Reduction Act. What can specific, what are some of the specific opportunity the opportunity that U.S. efforts like that can, can, can produce in terms of promoting uh, hemispheric production, trade, and in general, nearshoring with the region? Great. Thanks, Pepe, for the question. And congratulations to the uh, Atlantic Council for this initiative. It's really important, and it's important that it is a, a hybrid panel and that everyone is uh, talking from both from government, private sector, and think tanks, and civil society. We all need to be a part of this. Um, let me just mention a few things that, that you uh, raised in your question. The, the Inflation Reduction Act is what uh, we have called the a modern American industrial strategy. Um, and it identifies specific sectors that are important for economic growth and, and our national security. And so in order to make these investments, we need the private sector to do more, and, but we also know that government has to step in and play an incentivizing role. So uh, you know, the idea right now is for targeted public investment uh, will unlock the power and ingenuity of private sector and spur private sector investment, um, which will be the foundation for long-term growth. So what are the examples of that? You've mentioned the um, America's Partnership uh, and, and the Inflation Reduction Act. I'll just say on the Inflation Reduction Act, the idea is that we would be able to build a clean energy infrastructure and ecosystem uh, with all the supply chains in North America. Uh, the, uh, it, it contemplates $369 billion in energy energy security and climate change programs. Uh, the CHIPS and Science Act, which is to bring semiconductor and manufacturing to back domestically, we've mentioned it a few
few times here, not only domestically, but also near to our shores. Uh, that provides 39 billion in semiconductor incentives, but that will include also 500 million uh, for the State Department in the, not only the Western Hemisphere, but also the Indo-Pacific region in order to uh, work with our partners to secure mineral, uh, critical mineral imports, strengthen uh, international policy coordination, protect national security, and expand and diversify downstream capacity. Um, finally, the, I just want to mention the Mineral Securities Partnership, uh, which aims to develop and secure critical mineral supply chains uh, and move them closer to home by strengthening information sharing between partner countries, increasing investment, uh, and developing recycling technologies in secure critical mineral supply chains. Um, it, it, the point on all of these, you know, in the race to modernize and react with our economy to the sort of the, the trends that are developing, uh, we want to do it right. Uh, we want to uh, do it in a way that doesn't uh, recapture some of the practices of the past, but we want to make sure that we're doing it in the right way. Those are just some of the ideas. Thank you, that's well. And great to hear from about the, the Critical Minerals Partnership as well. Even though the current stage of this project is about Central America, focused on Central America and Mexico, we certainly want to explore further down south to other countries in the region. Um, next question, I want to turn it over virtually to Adriana, Adriana Ibarra Fernandez, who is a partner with Baker McKinsey based out of Mexico City. Um, Luz Maria previously mentioned uh, USMCA. Das Wells also mentioned the importance of North American integration. I know this is something you spend a lot of time working on. So let me ask you perhaps a very quick two minute response about what are, in what ways is USMC creating, creating unique advantages for, the, for Mexico specifically and of course for North American uh, as we think about this global competition for nearshoring? Hi, Pepe. Thank you very much for having me. I'm, I'm very glad to be here with that. It's very interesting. Uh, panel. Um, well, I think that um, the volumes of trade among the three countries stop by themselves and, and show that what we're capable of doing if we are integrated as a region. And as Luz Maria said, um, the USMCA modernized the legal framework for North America. It provided investors with legal certainty, and that is crucial when making a decision of where to set your operations to be close to your markets. Now, I believe the cornerstone of the agreement is the dispute settlement mechanism, which existed under NAFTA, but has been improved in several ways, including the selection of panelists and timing of procedures. And there's an important issue here, because after less than three years of having the agreement in force, there have already been five cases under Chapter 10 on trade remedies, four cases under Chapter 31, which governs disputes between states, and there are consultations between Mexico and the U.S. on the Mexican energy policy and genetically modified corn. But this does not mean that the agreement is not working. I think it's the opposite. It means that countries must abide by the commitments made in the USMCA because otherwise there are efficient mechanisms to address these issues. And there, if a country is not conforming its measures with such commitments, economic retaliatory uh, measures can be imposed. So um, countries have to, I mean, really bear this in mind, no? Um, moreover, um, the, the USMCA was modernized, and I think that after an exhausting negotiation to which Luna was part, I think, um, the, the, I think the CPTPP or the TPP uh, set the foundation for an agreement with a very good economic but also social view. Now we have labor and environmental provisions that are part of the agreement, and therefore they can be subject to the dispute settlement mechanisms. There is a chapter on small and medium enterprises, one on anti-corruption and one on, on uh, good regulatory uh, practices. And there are disciplines now that did not exist when, when the NAFTA became effective, such as uh, digital uh, trade and uh, telecom and uh, modernized provisions on intellectual property. So all these represents opportunities for companies to set facilities in the region uh, under the nearshoring trend, but not only from a region, because as someone mentioned uh, earlier today, we see a lot of investment from Chinese companies that are saying, OK, if there is a trade war uh, between the US and China, well, I'm going to set facilities near the US. I'm going to set facilities in Mexico, take benefit of the USMCA. And the same we are seeing with European companies. So the new showing trend um, is not only having U.S. Um, investment moving out of China and closer to 
uh, their markets, but it's also attracting investments uh, from other from other regions such as Asia and Europe. Thank you, Adrian. That's very helpful, and I think everyone in the audience is now already understanding some of the nuances that exist on a day-to-day -day level. Bring that on from the high-level conversation we've had earlier, and I'll say that as I think about these issues, we have the domestic pull factors that, that Luthma had mentioned earlier. We had the international pushback mm -hmm. that Daswa has mentioned, and I see USMC as a way to bridge those two, right? How do you bring the, the domestic specializations in Mexico, in U.S., and Canada through an international mechanism that's been successful so far? There are some challenges, but of course, we can work through those. So th thank you so much for that. Now I want to get even more specific into the opportunities and the specific challenges, and I'm going to put everyone on the spot to have one minute response. Uh, when it comes to challenges, I want to stay with you, of course, Aliana, for a bit, but perhaps ask Patrick the first question. As you work very closely with, with either companies have already re, a nearshore, reshored, or interest in doing that, what is the top challenge they, they, they face, and how have you, for example, helped them navigate that? And I'll ask the same question to Aliana, turning it over to you. Well, I think there's there's actually three. Um, there's a, it's starting to get a little bit crowded around the border because everybody wants to, of course, be as close as possible to the U.S. border. Uh, so that's starting to get tight in terms of space and labor and so on. Um, the second one is that Mexican suppliers right now are extremely busy. They get bombarded with RFPs, and some of them are either not able to respond or they give you a go-away price. So we advise our clients to basically not just do the usual RFP, but really go and look for partners that you want to work closely with, make it clear that you're serious, and then you get the attention. And we've had some of our clients sometimes four months pursue a supplier, but get a really good deal, basically. And then the third one is an ironic one, because whenever we talk about China, made in China was bad quality. Well, a lot of folks are c complaining or saying that they're challenged with getting good quality, both from reshored and nearshored operations. And that's one of the reasons why some of those Chinese companies coming over here are, are actually interesting from a US company perspective, because they're able to get you know, Mexican labor, Mexican plants, but with the knowledge from some of those Chinese companies that they've been dealing with for the past 30, 40 years, that helps them get that quality. Thank you so much. And I think that shows an additional nuance once again, bringing up this word. I think when we talk about this from a geo geopolitical lens and then we bring the private sector perspective, we some, some see some differential there. And to Adriana's point, it really is about how to make Mexico and North America more attractive to investment around the world, including European investment. Adriana, one minute response to you. If you can pick one challenge, if you could, uh, of the clients that you're working with, what would that be and how have you been helping them navigate that one? I think uh, the main obstacle is still the lack of regulatory and legal certainty and simplicity. And we see this in the administrative burden that setting up a company represents, uh, but most importantly, the lack of application of the rule of law. Um, um, on the administrative burden, I can mention a very important program which has been in place for many, many years, and that's the Maquiladora program. And during this administration, despite the nearshoring trend, we have seen less and less authorizations for uh, new maquila programs, uh, and that's because the requirements are being applied in a very stiff manner. Uh, and we're also seeing an increase in audits. So um, I think the advice for companies is compliance, 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 because if you abide by the rules and you are very, very strict in how you follow them, uh, you, you, you should be able to do business and, and run your business in Mexico. But if you face an audit, uh, you have to be very careful on being able to demonstrate that whatever you bring in was transformed and exported if you brought it in uh, under a maquiladora program or an IMEX program and have very strict controls of your, over your inventory control systems. And if you're getting a new program, I think that, that the message would be just... I think that compliance piece, um, in my mind, is very much connected to what Patrick has said. We see an opportunity. We want to make sure that countries have the ability to, to absorb that, both at a quantity and quality level. So thank you so much for that. Um, with that, I'll turn over two final questions, one virtually to, to our non-resident senior fellow again, um, uh, Luz Maria. And this is, once again, very quick response. We talked about the challenges with Patrick and with Ariana. We want to look at the opportunities. Uh, what is perhaps the one opportunity, top sector, or product, uh, sector and product that you want to look at uh, in the Mexican context? And I'll turn it over to perhaps a 30-second response to Das Wells about perhaps some call to US action from the US side. 
I think we lost Luis Maria for a second, so we'll skip that and go straight to Das Wells. Again, we talked a little bit about what we can expect from the region. This is obviously a two-way street. So if there's any message, whether that's a request or a concern that you have about advancing, reshoring, nearshoring the regional context from a U.S. government perspective, what would you say? Well, I, I think everyone here has already said it. It's certainty, right? And it's so it's a question of uh, do we have clear regulatory framework or the, do we have fair competition? Um, and, you know, and with this administration, what we've been working on is uh, increasing in, uh, environmental standards, labor standards. We've also had a very strong initiative on uh, anti-corruption. I mean, I think the challenge for us that we're facing is that we have to get our policy tools uh, modernized and in line and ready to go with the, with the geopolitical competition that is quickly materializing before us. And that's one of the challenges is trying to push the policy so that it sort of keeps up with the private sector and what's going on between the countries and within the countries. A final point, uh, just regional integration, uh, that the countries themselves are also um, harmonizing in the way that they treat each other from a trade perspective, environmental and labor standards, democracy, promotion of human rights. The more that they do that, the more that we're able to take advantage of that and diversify and, and uh, promote resiliency of supply chains. Thank you. I think my job as moderator is very easy when uh, the, the panelists refer to previous one that's been made. And this, in this particular case, I thought about what Senator Kennedy and also uh, Senator, uh, uh, Senator Cassidy and also Senator um, Bennett mentioned about ensuring that transparency, corruption piece, anti-corruption piece is in place. Uh, with that, we'll conclude this panel. Thank you, everyone, for joining us in person and virtually. Adriana, thank you so much. Great to have your expertise, as always. Luz Maria, of course. Thank you. Finally, you can go to bed. It's very late there, almost <laughs> night. And with that, we'll move on to the final panel. Thank you. Bye. Thank you very much. I know it's a very different perspective on some of the issues that we want to look into when it comes to reshoring, nearshoring. This final panel, we take a step back and we take a global perspective, and that's very consistent with the approach we take at the Adrian Arts Latin America Center. We don't want to look at Latin America and the Caribbean in a regional silo, but we want to look at it as an, as an, important, as an important actor in a global, in a global arena. Uh, and, and, with that, and with that, I think we have the best speakers to think about these global issues, big picture issues. Uh, join, join, joining me both in the studio, Kerry Contini, partner from Baker McKinsey, and Charles Lichfield, Deputy, Deputy Director and also Senior Fellow at our Geoeconomic Center. Um, Charles, I'll start off with you with a very tough question. Nearshoring, reshoring, to a lot of us, that's not a new movement. We heard about reshoring, we heard about nearshoring, we heard about ally shoring, right shoring, green shoring. Uh, a lot of buzzwords. So what really is new about these, the, the very latest of these movements, especially I want to ask you through the lens of the Geoeconomic Center, where you guys work a lot on economic statecraft, national security. So walk me through that. Well, I think I, against the backdrop of trade history, these still are quite new terms, and uh, they're also new in the sense that it hasn't quite been proven that it can be done. Uh, so we're still experimenting with them. Uh, I've noticed, following the excellent uh, panels today, that the term nearshoring is very popular uh, with the countries that are being represented. Uh, perhaps not too surprising, given where they are and given they're talking to Washington. Uh, not so popular uh, with other US allies who prefer the term ally shoring or perhaps friend shoring just because ally shoring is that bit too restrictive. Um, friend shoring, we're proud to say at the Geoeconomic Center, was first used by Secretary Yellen in this very room at this stage uh, when she made a speech um, not so long after uh, Putin's illegal uh, fully-fledged invasion of Ukraine. Um, and the message at that point was very clear, that uh, we have perhaps been too naive, the US and its closest allies, thinking that trade would change everyone's principles and make people more similar, make other countries more similar to us. And therefore, we need to be less geopolitically naive. Um, so friendshoring, I think, is um, 
the term that is most often used by US government officials, but they'll use nearshoring in other contexts. And I think in this particular context, it is most popular. Um, there are other, also other terms that are changing or evolving. Um, I'm glad to see that decoupling has now uh, been replaced by de-risking. I think this is a much more appropriate term when talking about um, the risks imposed on the global economy by China. Uh, I think it would be naive to think that we could decouple from China overnight. And uh, the data uh, proves this. Trade flows with China are recovering after the pandemic, um, but the investment is going in different directions to where it went before. So it's an early signal that we are reorienting uh, some of our trade um, flows, but that will take time. And so de-risking, I think, is just much more realistic as a term than uh, decoupling. Absolutely, and just great call out to uh, to French roaring. And I remember being in the same event space when Secretary Yellen mentioned French French roaring, and of course, just uh, demonstrates once again the geoeconomics excellent work, very much at the cutting edge of some of these conversations. Um, and uh, and you mentioned Ukraine as well. So on that, when it comes to sanction export control stuff, I can't help but but bring it to Kerry. You're an expert, leading expert on these issues. Love to hear more specifically about how sanction export controls have really impacted, affected global trade and production patterns, thinking about the nearshoring conversation we're having. Um, and, and do you see these patterns to continue, for example? Yeah, thank you. And, and from the beginning of the conversation today, Jason mentioned that there are push and pull factors, right? So now we're back in the push factor territory. And you know, sanctions and export controls have really become part of this conversation. We're hearing it from our clients and, and multinational companies that when they're talking about nearshoring or allah shoring or friend shoring, whatever you want to call it, they're, they're thinking also about the influence of sanctions and export controls that, that might push them towards a particular supply chain or away from a particular supply chain. You know, anything that causes disruption should be part of the conversation. And we know that when sanctions are imposed, they restrict business. They, they can prohibit certain business, and, 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 that, and that needs to be part of the discussion. So there's really no better example of that than, than the war in Ukraine and, and, and the sanctions that were imposed against Russia in the wake of that. We saw entire, we saw entire supply chains that had to be shifted because they all of a sudden became prohibited or or just too risky for multinational companies. Um, that was a very dramatic example, maybe not one that we'll see every day, but it is a trend that will continue. And in fact, even though it was kind of a, a, a dramatic, very extreme example of, of sanctions and export controls and the, the massive impact that they can have, it was actually a bit of a continuation of a trend that we were already seeing. I mean, for, for you know, probably up to around a decade now, we've been seeing sanctions and export controls being used in ways that impact a lot of mainstream business. It's not just rogue actors, you know, off in the corners and margins of society anymore. There are a lot of there are a lot of impacts that are felt by businesses around the world, and we do expect that trend to continue. Thank you for that, and I think that once again brings it to the day-to-day -day level. What are some of the challenges and opportunities that businesses are facing in this evolving global context? I want to turn it over to Charles. Uh, your final question for this panel. Um, at the Atlantic Council, we talk a lot, especially about the EU-US partnership, the transatlantic relationship that's super important. And when we talk about supply chains, we, all, we often talk about, for example, the recent G7 initiative. But we're going to put you on the spot here because you know this is, a, this is an event at the Adrian Arts Latin America Center working very closely with Geoff, East Geo Econ, of course. But from a global perspective, how does Latin America or how might Latin America fit into this global conversation about supply chain based on what you said earlier as well? Well, luckily, I listened to the previous panels, and so I have some things to pick out from them, uh, all very interesting. Um, uh, as some of the ministers from Central America were saying, it's very reassuring to see that there are some senators who are interested in the region. Uh, I think, unfortunately, um, every country is competing for interest in this, proving to not just the executive branch, but the legislative branch, uh, that they are friends, that they are near, and that um, everything should be done to encourage firms to invest there. Um, it is the firms that do the investment, after all. Um, the U.S. government uh, the U.S. government's powers are limited, but it can, um, through market access and also through trade facilitation, provide an indication that these are the right places to invest. It can also crowd investment into a particular destination uh, by providing some of the seed uh, capital, and that's being done uh, by um, this government through ESAID and other uh, outfits. Um, I was very interested to hear in the second panel 
the ministers being quite honest that they didn't think CAFTA was fit for purpose anymore. Um, so they are lucky in the sense that they are some of the only 20 countries that have a free trade agreement with the US. Um, but it was very interesting to me to hear that they don't think this is enough. Why? Uh, they look at USMCA and see that USMCA provided um, additional benefits, particularly to do with subsidies and providing carve-ins for those countries uh, where uh, CAFTA members uh, weren't, uh, didn't have access to them. So I know a little bit about the ins and outs of the Inflation Reduction Act process, and we don't need to go into that detail now. This argument that it's all to do with because certain provisos of USMCA that made it necessary for the US government to provide carve-ins for Canada and Mexico is, is nonsense. Uh, Canada did a very good job negotiating, and Mexico sort of benefited from Canada's negotiating prowess. It does mean, it is the case, of course, uh, that CAFTA do not have access to all of these subsidies. They don't have the carbon, so I can understand why they want to push for this. Very difficult when the US government is looking in all sorts of directions on French shoring. Um, and also, let's, let's be frank about this, the Biden administration isn't too interested in talking about market access or subsidies going for, uh, going uh, from the US government, from the federal, from the treasury, going to pr um, manufacturers abroad. They concede the political risk to doing that, and so they want to be quite strict into who they carve in. So a difficult one. Very happy to see that there's some interest uh, on the Hill, and specifically in the Senate, uh, but they weren't only talking about an act, or, or they were only talking about a draft for the moment. Um, in terms of what the US government is doing, apart from the trade facilitation, uh, in, uh, trade facilitation um, initiatives I mentioned, they've housed all of this uh, in a partnership similar to what they're doing with the EU, with the TTC, or with the Asia Pacific, with IPEF. It's a sort of um, talk shop plus. There are some initiatives to do a trade facilitation, but it hasn't really gone that extra mile that I think the two senators were calling for. It would be nice to see that, but we are always competing for the attention of the US government. And Europe is in the queue, in the line, so is Japan, so is Korea, so it's difficult. First of all, I appreciate you bringing the global perspective, and second of all, I appreciate you connecting the dots from previous panel, once again, making my job a lot easier. Really appreciate your comments, excellent. Um, and I think finally I want to turn it to Kerry to close us out. No pressure at all, Kerry, after a uh, very impressive multiple panels. And I want to connect a few things that have been mentioned earlier, including Charles. I think a few other panelists, including Patrick, have mentioned uh, increasing Chinese investment in the region, right? In addition to the geopolitical side, there is a practical aspect. The way I think about it is that supply chains sometimes need to be global and regional at the same time. We think about efficiency on one hand, now we think about resilience. It's about striking that balance. And then we also think about regional and global, like I mentioned earlier. So as you think about your clients, multinational companies that are potentially reorganizing their supply chains, how are you helping them strike that balance? If you can summarize any guiding principles that you might have, I think that would be super helpful to close out today's, close out today's panel. Yeah, I will say two things, which are in some ways quite simple, but they require taking a step back and, and, and getting out of the day-to-day -day and, and putting some resources and attention to this, right? One is risk assessment, the other is contingency planning. So it's hard to know how to weigh this balance if you don't know where your supply chains are and, and, and haven't really kind of looked at, looked at them deeply. You know, where are they? Are we over-reliant on one jurisdiction or another? Are we over-reliant on jurisdictions that seem higher risk for our, for our sector or for, for just our geographies? And then contingency planning. What are some of the worst case scenarios that could happen? What are some of the maybe not quite worst case, but still serious scenarios that could happen? And what are our alternatives? And that's what I would leave them with. Thank you for that. Um, I think the, this panel and of course the preceding panels as well have led us with a lot to think about. Uh, I want to thank both of you for joining in studio with us and of course the previous panelists as well in person and virtually. What a way to kick off our work on nearshoring related to French shoring as well as we think about these issues. Please stay tuned. We look, for, look forward to the opportunity to co collaborating with different actors within the public sector in the U.S. and Latin America and beyond uh, with the private sector and, of course, thinking through if there's any multilateral angle to that as well. Thank you again for tuning in. Have a, have a great rest of the evening. <laughs>